but it's a, it's a vast contrast between Virginia and South Carolina in this regard, because I think the Virginians who are leading the revolution, uh, they tend to come from the Piedmont. Mm -hmm. They're not people from what is the equivalent of the low country, the oldest settled parts of Virginia. That tends to be Tory Virginia, mm -hmm. the folks right near the Chesapeake Bay, at the mouths of the rivers. Those, those, you know, they're mixed there is areas there, but um, it's, it's people like Washington and Patrick Henry and Thomas Jefferson, people who lived in what had been the back country in 1720 or 30 of Virginia, but which is a well-settled area by the eve of the revolution. Um, those people are looking further west. They already live beyond the fall line, so they're, 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 they, they can't take advantage of being on you know, lowland rivers and easy mm -hmm. access to trade. And so they're looking westward uh, beyond the mountains, into the Ohio Valley, into Kentucky. And the revolution for them, on a practical level, is fought to, is to change the nature of the game, to empower them, to let them, you know, they, they, they're ambitious to become, you know, to, to, to acquire landed property in larger estates beyond the mountains. And you see that Washington is extremely acquisitive. Um, after the French and Indian War, buying up land claims along the Ohio River, which he expects to be settled in his lifetime. Now, they, most of them aren't, um, but that's not because he, he, you know, he didn't want them to be. Well, see, that there is the, one of the real differences, too, is that the southwestern portion of South Carolina, present-day Greenville, Oconee, and Pickens County was still Cher literally Cherokee territory, very heavily settled Cherokee territory. Those Revolutionary War land grants, after the Cherokee were knocked out in the early years of the Revolution, that's where South Carolina was issuing their land grant. Their, their expansion territory was still within the boundaries of, of the colony. When Washington is getting land grants before the Revolution, those guys are looking at Ohio, you've got people like Henry Lawrence, who would be president of the Continental Congress. He's taking out tens of thousands of acres of land grants in the back country of South Carolina. He's not going beyond the mountains. He doesn't have to worry about doing so. He can take care of his second and third and fourth sons without pressing on the frontier. Yeah. Well, see, South Carolina doesn't have primogeniture. They but they still, they still have to provide for their sons. So they're going to divide the estates. They're going to get smaller and smaller. They have, they have to provide for their sons, but because those who had it had so much, that really wasn't all that difficult to do. Uh, it was not unusual for one of those, those rice grandees, and I think that's a, an excellent term. Uh, in the Con Constitutional Convention, they called them the nabobs of South Carolina, but that's okay too. Uh, they might have four, literally four or five plantations, so give, even leaving a plantation complete with slave force to a daughter was not, was not uncommon. Um, so th they, it's, it's hard to imagine how rich they were. And, and I, I know you and I both have laughed about Alice Hanson Jones and her wealth of a nation to be. Well, when she lists that table of the 10 richest Americans on the eve of the revolution, nine of those 10 are South Carolinians. The wealth that they had was greater than many countries in the world today, if you, if you make it in constant dollars. It's extraordinary. I mean, you look at revolutions anywhere in the world in the last 250 years to have a, you know, the wealthiest class of people who live in any area to, to not only join, but be at the principal leaders of a resistance, a revolutionary movement, which is so much at risk. Um, that part of the story is, is really quite extraordinary for well, South Carolina. Well, well, it is. And, you know, it's, at one point people used to say, well, low country was predominantly this or the back country that. It was all, it was all mixed up. Some of your strongest bands of Tories are going to be back country, German back country settlers. Right. Uh, but, you look at Rutledge's and Lawrence and Gadsden and Moultrie. Uh, these people have a lot to lose, and yet they're the ones who are sticking their necks out. Yes, there's some there's some rich folks in South Carolina who who are who are Tories. The Loyalist transcripts are a fabulous document. It's it's a cross section of the population, so it's it's a story that as you say, is not often told. If you had everything to lose, why would you put it on the line? I mean, it's, and it's not wealth you can transport. I mean, if you own six plantations in, in the low country and you've got 
as some of them did, two or three hundred slaves, it's not like saying, okay, I'll transfer my money to the Bank of London and it'll be safe. It's not going to be safe. And it wasn't. The British walked off with 25% of the labor force in South Carolina. 